Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report for Monday, October 15th. We have for us on the first and third hour a very special part one and part two is Barry Chamish. Probably one of the most important um, Jewish authors and investigative journalists in the world right now. And his materials and books, such as uh, Shep Taitzvi and Labor Zionism, his other books are amazing. You can get them at uh, lulu.com if you just uh, Google or go to the site lulu.com and put Barry Chamish. Um, Barry, you also have a website as well. Uh, well, that's easy enough. BarryChamish.com. Yeah, that's C H A M I S H. Barry, B A R R Y, Chamish, C H A M I S H dot com. Barry, uh, you've got a lot to say. I'm not going to interrupt as much as I usually do. I'm going to try to just say rah rah, keep telling us. But uh, well, a lot of things need to be set straight in terms of the uh, driving forces of our geopolitics, especially of the current state of Israel and uh, the Sabbateans. And you're probably one of the most uh, well-researched uh, people on the earth and that, that still has a pulse. <laughs> Although the powers that be try to eliminate that pulse a number of times. Let's uh, get into the subject of... of uh, uh, the current, and it'll lay the groundwork for a show we're going to do on Wednesday because we're going to do a part one and part two, hour one and three today, and part three, and we're going to have another show on Wednesday afternoon and hour three because this is very timely, the information you're going to present today. All right, let's go to it. I warn your listeners, um, if you're stuck in, the, in uh, well, let's just say mainstream history, leave it at that, you're going to have trouble with this because this is what actually happened and a lot of Jewish scholars know about this and now you're going to hear it for the first time most of you okay look what we're going to do we're going to for the first part we're going to quote a very well also mainstream history it's Jerry Rabo's book 50 Jewish Messiahs in the second half we'll get to my friend um, Marvin Antleman, Rabbi Antleman wrote to eliminate the opiate. But let's start with very traditional history. What I'm going to be quoting is what Jewish scholars know. And let's just start with Shabtai Tzvi. Now, Shabtai Tzvi had a congregation in Gaza. Uh, by the way, to me that's very important, but we won't dive into that right now. The point is, from his little itty-bitty congregation in Gaza, he started a movement that spread, well, all the, all the books say the same thing, from Iran to Mexico, uh, which leads me to believe that in the 17th century, you couldn't get uh, any idea to go from Iran to Mexico without the Vatican. They were the only ones that had agents in every continent, but leave that be as well. Let's see what he did. Now again, from Jerry Rabo's book, 50 Jewish Messiahs. Oh, and by the way, he does call Shabtai Tzvi the most damaging messiah to the Jewish people. Surprise, surprise. Here are the quotes. He changed the holiday celebrations and violated the dietary prohibitions. All this followed from his declaration that the usual rules were inapplicable to messianic times. And I repeat, this is my voice. In the 17th century, Shabtai Tzvi had half the Jews of the world thinking he was going to, well, he was about to be the Messiah, half the Jews in the world. He declared that the coming of the Messianic age meant that biblical commandments were no longer binding. He proclaimed that God now permitted everything. I'm going to just jump for the only time to Rabbi Antelman's central assertion that Sabbatianism was the polar opposite of Judaism, that Shabbat Tzvi's program was to destroy the Torah and replace, replace uh, the wisdom of Judaism with their very opposites. In other words, everything in the Torah is right in the opposite sense. That's Shabtai Tzvi. The most obvious example is do not murder became do murder. And that had a terrible consequence for the Jewish people uh, in the 1940s of this era. But then it happened. 
Shot types be on, well, the 15 months Sivan doesn't mean much to you, but on June 18th of 1666, Shabtai Tzvi declared that he was the Messiah. Now again, he had help. Uh, just to let you know, if you didn't figure it out, June is the sixth month. 18 divided by 3 is 666, and the year 1666 is pretty obvious. Now either Shabtai Tzvi knew what he was doing, or uh, all the prophecies of a false, evil Messiah are right. He was helped along on this little journey. They wanted to infiltrate the Jews with this so-called new theology. Yeah, and now, you mentioned to me before, because we've had you on a few uh, over the years a number of times, Barry. The the numbers, like you're one of the main sources for me about this issue, which I dug even and found other sources that corroborate what you've said. The percentage of Jews that believed in Shabtai Tzvi, or later on in Jacob Frank, um, Jacob Frank, that this really had some tr profound effects on the direction of Judaism uh, and modern history. Oh, did it ever. But let me keep on going with this. Shabtai Tzvi now declared he was the Messiah. And his followers climbed mountains, sold their goods for a penny on the dollar. They thought they would be transported to the New Jerusalem. That's how deluded they were. Oh, but, boy. Well, yeah, it was, again, uh, desperation leads to desperate moves, but Shabtai, in the New Age, by the way, Shabtai's first proclamation was that the new prayer, you know, when you wake up in the morning to say a prayer, and in Hebrew it should be Shema Yisrael, uh, whatever, in Hebrew it's not this one. Shabtai's new prayer was, Praise it be he who permits the forbidden. And while you imagine getting up first thing in the morning and say, well, praise be he who permits the forbidden. Now, in this new age of the Messiah, the Shabtai Tzvi Messiah, Shabtai declared that, well, all the old restrictions of the, of the Torah were no longer applicable. Oh, my he gosh. Yeah. Well, he, he abolished the laws concerning sexual relationships. Uh, it was just a, an orgy all through the world, if you were Jewish. He eventually declared there were 36 major biblical sins. He now said that they were all permitted, <laughs> all right? And he instructed his followers that it was their duty to perform the sins in order to hasten the redemption. I mean, this madness really, really took place, and it wasn't small-time stuff. It eventually led to labor Zionism, and you're right. We will get to that, okay? And you're right. My book is Shabtai Tzvi, Labor Zionism, and the Holocaust, Holocaust, and I did trace it. But no, we have to go slow now. I hope your listeners found that an anti-Jew became the Jewish Messiah uh, in the year 1666, and his name was Shabtai Tzvi. Right, because the, the basis of, uh, of Judeo, think, uh, Judeo th thinking was the basis of everything, including uh, the rise of Christianity, the rise of even the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And all of these things, including the modern era of these advanced nations that had uh, the, the rise of logic and the, uh, the Renaissance, all came out of, uh, of true Judaism, Torah Judaism. I not wouldn't this, uh, say that at all. This is 1666. Yeah, I'm talking uh, about the good side. I'm not talking about the negative side. I'm talking about the good side. The Constitution was, and the Bill of Rights were incredibly, incredibly influenced by Shabtai Tzvi. Look, let me go on, all right? Yeah, yeah. I, I want, but in other words, what I want to try to say is that the good side of Judaism was being overshadowed by this horrible anti-Judaism that rose with the Shabtai Tzvi that caused such horror and was one of the main factors of some of the terrors of the 20th century. And we come back. For sure. We come back. Lots more with Barry Chomish, two part special, part one, hour one, part two, hour three today. Welcome back, and uh, Barry, uh, let's go through this. 
uh, to be honest with you, this is riveting history. It's very important people get the details because, as they say, the devil's in the details. Uh, Rabbi Antelman, one of your mentors, gave a lot of this information. You dug further, and probably the most important living person that knows this knowledge about Sabbateanism and how dangerous it is not only for Jews in the state of Israel, but the whole planet. Um, continue. All right. Now, it's 1666. For three months, he is the Messiah of the Jews. Now, again, I'm returning to middle of the road. Jerry Rabel wrote a book that's typical uh, of Jewish middle of the road thinkers. Nothing conspiratorial about this. Now, what happened is that the Sultan of Turkey got really ticked at all the attention uh, that he was getting in Gaza, and he, well, he brought him to his court, basically put a knife under his throat and told him unless he converted to Islam that he would be tortured to death. Now, Shabtai Svi, the coward that he was, relented, and then most of Jewry abandoned him for the coward he was. But not all. A core of his followers kept their Messiah alive and kicking hard. Again, we're back to Jerry Rabel. A quote, in order to bring on the Reformation, now this is after he converted. He had a, a scholar, he had a philosopher, uh, uh, Nathan of Gaza, uh, who explained why he converted to Islam uh, to the satisfaction, unfortunately, of certain followers. Here's the quote. This is Nathan, of course, saying that in order to bring on the Reformation, Shabtai had descended into the darkness of the Muslim world to gather the scattered fragments of the light of creation hidden there. Now, for anyone to even understand that argument, I mean, even today, somebody says a thing like that, and he can go take a hike. Uh, who's going to fall for it? But he yeah. went on. He said, again, Rabel, there was an outward reality and an inner reality. What, in short, Nathan transferred Shabbatianism into a theology of paradox. Once the followers accepted the concept of paradox, they would be able to keep on believing in Shabbat Tzvi, the Messiah. Sadly for all of us, an inner circle of his followers accepted Nathan's explanations and continued to believe in Shabtai the Messiah. One group were the Shabtai, the Shabtai followers. It was the Turkish sect of the Donma. That's D-O-N-M-E-H. And by the way, they continue extensively in, in Turkey to this day. Yeah, now, that's important. Well, this is kind of a, a gap between the next Messiah, Jacob Frank, uh, who, you know, he was born 50 years after Shabtai Tzvi died. But it, without the dogma, he wouldn't have known about Sabbateanism. Look, the dogma, look, in... When I was in uh, university in Jerusalem, a pretty Turkish girl thanked me for the uh, wonderful things that Jews had brought to Turkey, like democracy. I said, what are you talking about? There's like 50,000 Jews in Turkey. And she says, oh, no, there's not. She says there's millions. I didn't know what she was. Today, I know what she was talking about. The Dharma converted Remember, this is a stopgap before Jacob Frank, the second Messiah, is born. And believe it or not, this is actual history. I'm going to quote Rabo again. As, and as I say, this is not conspiratorial history. Far from it. The Dharma now converted the Sabbatean Purim into an annual orgy when members exchanged spouses for a ceremony called Extinguishing the Lights. Now, if you know anything about Purim, it's a kid's holiday. It's a happy holiday. It's the Halloween of Judaism. Haman was defeated. Mordecai rose, and it's a happy holiday. For the Sabbateans, you were ordered to exchange marital partners. Yeah, and kids, for kids, 
It's where they make the hamadasha cookies and the other things. You're right. It the is. whole thing, the, the groggers, yeah. and they twirl them when the name Haman comes up. It's a kid's holiday. Right. Well, for the Sabbateans, it was the holiday was now called Extinguishing the Lights. Oh, boy. And they justified their poor margies. And by the way, their regular practice of sharing wives. I mean, they they were real loose sexually, all right? Putting it mildly. They engaged in any kind of sexual activities, citing biblical precedents. Now, that's the stopgap. Without the Dharma, a Jacob Frank wouldn't have been born. And here's where... Just follow me. It's heading into true conspiracy. He was Shabtai. He believed he was the second Messiah, Shabtai's fees, true successors. Now, we return again to Rabo. Frank's followers requested ecclesiastic protection on the grounds that their own beliefs were not Jewish, but rather anti Talmudist. The, well, the, his diocese bishop, he appealed to him declared that the anti-Talmudists, uh, Frank's followers, in other words, were entitled to practice their religion and ordered that all copies of the Talmud be hunted down and uh, destroyed. Mm -hmm. Now remember, Europe doesn't have the grand nations. It has all kinds of papal dioceses. Jacob Frank went to his bishop and said, we're not Jews, we hate Judaism, we're the opposite of Jews. For that, he got protection of the local crown. Now, all kinds of Jews, by the way, gave Frank big donations for the freedom uh, that, that, that he uh, uh, caused the Jews of his diocese with and this, by the way, is from Jerry Rabel. We are going to get into Rabbi Antelman, but for now, let's just quote Jerry Rabel. He extended the paradoxical, uh, sorry, paradoxical teachings of Shabtai Sfi that the coming of the Messianic age had transformed sexual prohibitions of the Bible into permissions even obligations. According to Jacob Frank, engaging in sexual orgies became the means to purify the soul from its sins. C can you imagine that? That's so bizarre, isn't it? I mean, it's really uh, the, the, the heart of, if you want to call it Satanism or anti-Judaism. It's the exact opposite of true Torah Judaism. Well, if you want to have some fun, I guess this was the group to join. But what it came down to is debauchery became therapy. Oh, okay, boy. outright. Sounds like a version of psychiatry. We'll be back in a moment with more remarkable revelations. Again, you want to get the books at lulu.com. Shaptaitsvi and the Rise of Labor Zionism and many more with very Thomas. Required reading if you want to really know what's going on in modern history. Back in a moment. Welcome back, and uh, Barry Chamish. Uh, Barry, uh, let's continue this history. It's very important that people understand that this is what's driving not just history of the Jews and the state of Israel, but the whole planet now. This is the driving force toward things that are not good. So, Barry, I'd rather interrupt. Please continue. Well, again, we go back to this so-called paradox that Shabbat Shalom became a Muslim uh, because he was going to enter them and infiltrate them and change them from within. None of that was true, but it worked. It convinced a group in Turkey, the Dharma, to keep his word alive. Now, what you have, let's say 1759, Almost a century later, it's the rise of Jacob Frank, who was a Sabbatean. Now, again, he preached this business of no sexual prohibitions. I'm going to mention Israel only once. You should have been on a kibbutz in the 1920s. You would be laid nonstop. It was a... Uh, 
it's not written about, but that was practiced in in Israel uh, by the labor Zionists uh, right from the beginning of of labor Zionism. But let's go back all the way to 1759. You now have a situation where Jacob Frank has convinced, convinced the a bishop of his diocese to accept their religion as anti-Talmudist, and he did, and then Frank gave the bishop a present. In 1759, they brought over 5,000 so-called new Christians. They were Sabbateans, but just like Jacob Frank, they joined Christianity uh, to work from within. Now, what well, what can you say? 5,000 of these new Christians came from Poland, Moravia, you'd expect that, but also from Turkey. What were, what was anyone from Turkey doing in Poland, uh, being, uh, uh, baptized as a Christian, uh, but staying a Sabbatean? It happened. Jacob Frank had all kinds of ties to the Dharma. Now, I'm going to read again Rabel, because very shortly we're going to be coming up to Ethelman, and he takes off from, from where Rabel gets lost. Uh, he writes, The Frankists also became involved in international political intrigue and sent secret emissaries to the Russian government and the uh, Eastern Orthodox Church Helping, well, they told them they were going to help overthrow Poland and the Catholic Church. You could be sure that was a line. But nonetheless, he was involved in major espionage, and that's how he stayed alive uh, from 1759 on. These new Christians were no longer Jews. They could actually enter uh, places where Jews couldn't, and he used that as an advantage. He sent spies all over the place. But now here, well, I'm going to quote Rabel once again. In 1786, Frank suffered a temporary financial uh, problem. He moved his court to Offenbach near Frankfurt. There, Frank's money problems were somehow solved. The source of Frank's immense, immense new wealth is not clear. And then he speculates that he used his secret messengers and clandestine cells uh, to somehow give, uh, give him money. This is where he, it's just too deep for him. This is the middle of the road Jewish thinking about Shabtai Tzvi and Jacob Frank, and it's worrying enough that this is not conspiratorial. Now we're going to head into Rabbi Marvin Antelman. And folks, I want you to know he was my friend for over 20 years. He's still my friend. He's not young anymore, but I've got someone on my radio program who is in personal touch with him. He's still doing his best. Rabbi Anselman's book was called uh, To Eliminate the Opiate. The Opiate was religion. Ah, what okay. He, and of course, that fits in with uh, Bolshevism, etc. Bolshevism was part of the... Uh, the grand conspiracy certainly wasn't part of uh, Rabbi Marvin Antelman. No, uh, he, exactly, but yeah, but obviously it's for, it ties in with uh, Sabbatianism. Please continue. Ties in. He wrote the book. Without this book, nobody would know anything. Look, yeah. Rabbi Antelman said that while well, he knowed it, that Frankfurt, where Jacob Frank moved his whole congregation. Every, from Poland to Frankfurt, all his followers followed him. Frankfurt, Germany, at the time, was the headquarters of the Jesuit Adam Weishaupt. He was the founder of the Illuminati, ah. as well as the Rothschilds. <clears throat> Mayor Amschel Rothschild was a crummy coin salesman. He had an idea that if you got control of a nation's finances, you got control of the nation. He had a, a, a well, the idea seems so obvious today, uh, but he found a way to get control 
of European and world nations. Now, I'm going to repeat this. Frankfurt was the birthplace of both the Illuminati and the Rothschild Empire. Now, when Jacob Frank entered the city, the, the alliance between these two had already begun. Weishaw provided the conspiratorial resources of the Jesuit order, but they did, well, they had one goal, and that was to eliminate uh, the Protestant Reformation. That's what the Illuminati originally was founded for, to, to muck up any country that didn't look to Rome, uh, well, and the Pope uh, as their true gods. The Rothschilds contributed the money. Weishaupt con uh, contributed the conspiracy. What was missing was a way to spread the agenda of the Illuminati. Remember, the Illuminati were very banned all through Europe. They had problems. What the Frankists added was their network of agents throughout the Christian and Islamic worlds. Jacob Frank, this is where Jerry Rabel writes, the source of his immediate wealth is not clear. It was to Rabbi Antelman. Jacob Frank became instantly wealthy because he was given a nice handout by Mayor Amsel Rothschild of Frankfurt. Frankfurt is the conspiracy capital of the world to this day. What amazing. came up... Pardon me? It's quite amazing, but it's true. Okay, please continue. Look, you have three people who don't necessarily have much in common. All they had was a great deal of initiative and drive. Believe me, Rothschild didn't want to give money uh, to Frankists who were the opposite of Judaism. All right, that wasn't his idea. And the Illuminati sure didn't want the Frankists. They didn't want anything Jewish in their organization, but they all had different goals and somehow their drive and Rothschild's money brought them together and the Illuminati from that point on became associated with the Sabbateans or the Frankists because there was a deal made where they would spread their their influence, the Illuminati's influence with the help of the Frankist agents. Is that clear enough? Yeah, in other words, uh, there's a, there was a dark alliance made to spread the Frankist, uh, yeah, okay, that made total to sense. To spread the Illuminati, really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nobody talks about the Sabbateans. Nobody talks about the Frankists. They all say Illuminati. People don't even know what the Illuminati was. Exactly, yeah. In other words, without this alliance, they probably wouldn't have spread and infiltrated governments all over the world and corporations and the current state of affairs with the global banksters, etc. It'll, it will eventually get there. Yeah. Well, we'll be back in a moment with Amazing Report, Part 1, with Barry Chavez. Nutra Medical Report. Barry, please continue. This is a very important part. Part two, by the way, will be in hour three today. In hour two, we're going to open up in the second and third segments for open lines as well, so you can call in on any wellness question. No, uh, this is hour right, two. I have to rush this. I no, no, there's no rushing. I'm talking about an hour. For Wednesday. This, no, no, this is hour two. That when I'm, you get a break for an hour, Barry. I then know. You get a, then we'll have you. Then we'll have you back on. There's open lines on health issues, uh, so we'll do that now. Barry, please continue. Oh, boy. Um, all right, all I want to tell you is I'm giving you the background. My hour, two starts with the Holocaust uh -huh. and the, the foundation of Israel, and it's every bit as complicated as this. But look, from this starting point, my, my buddy, Marvin Antelman, gave us a blueprint for the war against Judaism, and it took me two decades to believe him. So for those listeners who are having trouble, uh, I had plenty myself. 
Look, it was a war against Judaism, against humanity, its moral treasures, and it was replaced by a movement of complete evil. Right now, the fr- well, look at look who's involved in this triangular conspiracy out of Frankfurt. The Jesuits' goal was the uh, destruction of the Protestant Reformation. <laughs> you know, anyone who didn't think the Pope was sitting in judgment all man, uh, over all mankind uh, had uh, lots of trouble in his kingdom, all right? The Rothschild's goal was to, to, to lend money, event, essentially, was to bankrupt uh, governments through their economic system, to lend money to governments and then control them. Eventually... Yeah. Uh, he had a view that using the system he could control the wealth of the planet. But what can I say? It worked. It was a great idea, and it worked. He had five sons. He sent them all over the place, offered to lend governments money. Uh, they reneged, and the next thing you know, they had control. Now, the Frankist vision or the Sabbatean vision was the most worrisome to me. And the most hidden of all of this it was the, the destruction of Jewish ethics to, re, well, to be replaced by a religion based on the opposite, the exact opposite of God's intentions. Right. Now, when these, when these three blended, no matter how much they didn't get along, they eventually did it at some level because a bloody war against humanity was initiated, but the Jews were on the front lines. And look, Rabbi Antelman, he traced the means of, of this worldwide stretch of this ugly, ugly conspiracy. And by the way, people have it so wrong. They have the people right. They don't have the, without an understanding of the Sabbateans or the Frankists, either one you could call them, well, Every history is wrong. Every so-called biblical prophecy is wrong, all right, if they don't understand that. Now, yeah. in the 1770s, you, you have to understand why, why Jake um, Weishaupt would even accept this oddball Jewish organization uh, <laughs> into his uh, uh, conspiracy against Protestants. The Illuminati was exposed, and it was banned everywhere, starting in Germany. Look, the old story about before the French Revolution, a horseman fell, and in his satchel were the plans for the revolution. That's the common, the common explanation. The fact is, the Illuminati uh, were really disliked all over the place, and they were banned all through Europe. He. Weishaupt had to find a way to spread uh, his agenda uh, without appearing to. The goal that he and I believe all of them, including the Frankists, I'm sure it was the Frankists as well, you say, well, in short, you take something that already exists with lodges all over the world, with tremendous political power, you infiltrate them, and over time, you change their highest tenants, tenants to yours, until every lodge, you know, the Masons might have been all right. It's very hard to tell, but after the Illuminati infiltrated them, they weren't all right. Yeah. Previous to that, they may have really uh, <laughs> been a union of, of bricklayers. Yeah, but, exactly. In other words, it became, they were ultimately benign. If, uh, in, in other words, they might have exchanged business, but they weren't malevolent to the extent of full infiltration by the Illuminati. Yeah. Yes. And again, I won't go into the uh, the building of Washington and all that. But by then, the, by then, the Illuminati had changed uh, Freemasonry, and uh, it gets uh, well. We won't do that now, all right? Now, look, what do we have is a situation, a new situation in Europe. The Illuminati could not stay in Germany and spread their agenda. They could be raised there, but they went to London to do that now, where they could write whatever they wanted. They weren't banned. And what you got 
well, from Germany to London, the apostate Jews, Karl Marx, Frederick Engels, they they were sent to devise communism. And, oh, as for the Jews, uh, uh, well, Rothschild agents, again, John Jacob Astor, Jacob Schiff, they were from Germany. And from Germany, they sent their religious co-conspirators uh, to America. They founded, look, I'm not sure you understand what Reform Judaism is and Conservative Judaism. It all came from Germany, went to America, and it just, well, it really did destroy the the morality of Judaism. I mean, Reform Jews are breaking Judaism every which way, but they are not Sabbateans. And that was their problem. We'll get to that shortly. Just know this, that the, the robber barons, that the Schiffs and the Astors financed, they, well, Rockefeller, Morgan, just for starters, uh, they're the big ones. In 1922, they founded the Council on Foreign Relations. Yeah, and, and uh, of course we know that Netanyahu is a council member, so I, that's under well, dropped I, a little. Well, I would worry more about Mitt Romney being a CFR member than than Netanyahu. Yeah, I would say matter. so. Yeah, we'll leave, we'll pick that up on Wednesday when we expand this more. Uh, we're expanding yeah. it plenty. What you uh, got? Yeah. The CFR was founded to overthrow the American Constitution, and make uh, no mistake about that. And the idea was to switch the nation's diplomacy to Illuminism. That's why you had a CFR, and that's eventually why you had an Israel. Now, how much time do I have right now? Right now, in about another two or three minutes, and then we are back on for another hour in another hour's time. All right, I'm just going to start nice and easy then. <laughs> Before we get started, we're going to talk about, we're, lead, we're now in the 20th century. We know how it's working now. We know it's worked against America. That is for darn sure. But in 1932, well, listeners, ask yourself, how many organizations in Germany represented the Jews? Over 250. In 1934, guess how many? One, and only one, labor Zionism. Wow. Oh, we'll get to the significance in the second hour. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, there was, if you wanted to escape the Nazis in Germany, you had one choice, the labor Zionism choice. And they had camps set up. In these camps, they turned doctors, teachers, professors, dentists, lawyers, into farmers. <laughs> they believe in the redemption of the land. And Okay, we'll see you in an hour. Absolutely amazing. When we come back, more on part one, part two coming up in hour three. Uh, in hour two, we're going to also take in the second and third segments some call-ins at 800-259-5791, health issues only. Amazing show coming up tomorrow with Stan Deo, hour number one, Jonathan Gray, hour three, Harley Schlanger on on Wednesday, and then Barry Chamish will be back for much more. And we're going to talk about the Sephardim and much more in terms of things like CFR membership of people like Mitt Romney and uh, his buddy, Mr. Netanyahu. Uh, tying it all together, Barry Chamish back in an hour. See you then. See you soon, Barry. Take care. Welcome back to the Nutri Medical Report. We have Barry Chavish back for round number two, and of course Barry is ready and re rolling. We have some remarkable uh, dots to connect here today. So Barry, please continue with the history of Sheptaitsvi and, and the uh, the link to Turkey, which we talked about in the first hour. The link we'll, to these. We'll get to that. Yeah. Turkey uh, is again. You like to go off on uh, tangents. Uh, I'm well, I do on breaks. I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to assault the the whole audience. Although, I, what I want you to do is, we get into future shows Wednesday and beyond, is to connect it with current the current candidates, 
uh, and what's going on in world politics because when they know your history and they read your books, they're going to start really understanding what's really going on and how it's like Don King who had both fighters in the ring. We remember George Foreman and Muhammad Ali. And someone asked him in one of the TV interviews, he said, well, uh, who's going to win the fight? And he said, I'm going to win the fight. He said, you're not in the ring. He says, I got both men in the ring. Either one of them is going to win. I always win. Well, that's sort of where the no contest uh, right. concept. That's what we have with the globalists. I mean, they're going to give us a form of communist uh, global totalitarianism with Obama, and they're going to give us a CFR bankster globalist for uh, communism. You get you know, CFR with Obama too. All right, exactly. let's go to the dry history. All right. Yeah. Let's let's get all caught up of, uh, with uh, facts that again. They may be dry, but you can't ignore them. Right. Now, look, I started saying that labor Zionism was the only organi- Jewish organization allowed by the Nazis, and we'll, we'll get there. Now, we have finished with Jerry Rabel. Again, middle-of-the-road Jewish history. We're on to Rabbi Antelman, who is, well, he's cracked the nut. Now, what he writes in his books is that, well, to corrupt the Jews, uh, the Frankists were, you know, at first very humane. Uh, they had Rothschild money and they had all kinds of power from the Jesuits. This led to something called the Enlightenment. It was in- initiated by a Jewish, uh, German, of course, I mean, always German, apostate. His name was Moses Mendelssohn. By the way, his family all became Christians and who knows what they really believe. Um, but, also, Napoleon was financed to liberate Jews, and the reform and the conservative movements were financed in America to dilute the faith. And, by the way, every synagogue that's operating west of the Mississippi is reform. Uh, they were trying to introduce totally foreign concepts to the Jews, but it wasn't working. I mean, these these ordinary Jews just weren't were not cooperating with evil, and uh, I, you know, they would not denounce Torah morality, uh, and a decision was made, and by whom, and I can't tell you the date, but I can tell you it was done, <laughs> right? And that yeah. was to remove these Jews uh, and uh, allow only those practicing Sabbatianism to survive. And that is no joke. Now look, in in 2,000 years of Jewish history in Europe, there were pogroms, there were crusades and inquisitions, by the way, abetted by the Jesuits. But compared to what happened from the 1880s on, it was a picnic. Look, the, the final turning point in the war against the Jews, and that's what this is. Uh, was the founding of labor Zionism by the Sabbateans. Right. That, that was in the late 19th century. Look, the final aim of the movement was to establish a Sabbatean state in Israel, in the historical land of the Jews, get rid of the rest of them, and thus take over Judaism for good, make a Sabbatean. Right, in other now, words, get rid of the uh, Torah rabbis, uh, oh, they tried. Yeah. They, they did a real job in Europe. Um, now, I'm not going to dive into that. I have lots of things to say yeah. about how that was done. But first, the, the raw history. Look, the idea was to make life so intolerable for a European Jew that an escape to Palestine would appear to be the best option. Now, the the Cossack pogroms, that's what brought my grandparents to America. Uh, they were the first shot in the campaign. And, you know, looking at the conspiracy, the Frankists turned to the Jesuits and their influence over the Catholic Church, and the Jesuits, uh, the Weishauptians, turned to the Frankists for, for the communists. 
uh, well, what they were going to do was just turn anyone who was anti-papist uh, into, uh, well, they, they would be living in a feudal camp, uh, commune. They did that all over the world, including South America. The Jesuits provided the Cossacks, the Francis, the Communists, and, well, needless to say, the Rothschilds, the money. This was the conspiracy. This is what has been happening. And by the way, a lot of people know the basics. You know, they know about Weishaupt. They know about the Rothschilds, but they don't know about the Sabbateans. Yeah, that's important that they don't, they don't really understand it fully because without understanding what you teach, they're really going to be missing giant pieces of the puzzle that'll explain why we're where we're at, where we're at with world history. Well, you can thank Rabbi Antelman, not me. Yeah. I just kind of added to it. You were a good student. Let's let's continue. Yeah, look, once it was decided uh, to plant the Jews in a labor Zionistic Israel, well, out of Germany, well, the German world, Vienna, there are people you've never heard of, Nathan Birnbaum and Parrot Smoleskin. They got streets named uh, <coughs> after them, sorry, in Tel Aviv. And they were writing, you know, they added more intellectual justification for returning to a safe home in, in Israel, but they didn't have charisma. One, one person did. Uh, his name was Theodor Herzl. He could rally masses that neither of them could, and he was chosen to be spokesman and symbol. By the way, of, of they called it Zionism. It was labor Zionism. And we'll, we'll talk a little about that, too. Look, you read any honest biography of Herzl, and the same problem appears every time. Herzl claimed he wrote the Judenstadt, that means the Jewish state. It's the Torah of Zionism. Uh, he said he wrote it in, uh, one summer in Paris. But every history says the same thing. Herzl wasn't in Paris when he said he wrote the book. It had to have been written for him. And by the way, <coughs> Herzl wrote plays. And uh, uh, parts of them have survived. And if you read those plays, you have to doubt his uh, sudden departure from literary mediocrity. I mean, this guy was a hack. Yeah. But he, be well... <coughs> Excuse me, I'm congested a little bit. He was a literary yeah, hack, but he was also uh, very good at, 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 like Obama, at raising up a crowd and getting them activated. Is that what you're saying? Uh, he was the best at that. He was yeah. a hero. I mean, he was Elvis of Eastern Europe. But yeah. in 1901, uh, Herzl went to Britain, and he was not well received. Now, we are reading different histories, but they all agree that he was no longer in favor of a Jewish state in Palestine. He would rather have one in uh, East Africa, uh, Rhodesia, and you know how that story ended. Now look, if, right. this idea, if this idea caught on, it would neutralize the whole Sabbatean game plan. It had to be in Israel. Well, we know why, all right? Rhodesia wouldn't have done the trick. Now, Herzl died not long, what was it, uh, 1901, he died. Yeah, a few years later, he died and was no longer with us. He died at age 45. He went to a sanatorium in Paris and never emerged, and nobody knows why. Ah. Raising more questions. Oh, I think we're giving more answers. I know, I'm just uh, being a little facetious. Back in a moment with Barry Chavish. Check out his books at lulu.com and at playandiron.com. And uh, Barry, let's continue, please. Uh, so you have a lot to thank for Rabbi Antelman, who is now in his 80s. Uh, please continue with your story and connecting these dots. Well, once Herschel was removed, um, they had they went they well. There was no more 
Rhodesia talk. The leader of uh, Zionism didn't want to go to Rhodesia anymore because he was dead. Uh, what they did over time, not all that much time, but they put their own in power in Israel. Now, during World War I, uh, there was a German, always German, by the way, always, a German-educated Jew, his name was Chaim Weissman. Uh, he be well, just so you know, there was this legend was fabricated involving the Balfour Declaration. Uh, that's the uh, British uh, government's declaration of sympathy to a Jewish uh, homeland in Israel. That was a letter sent to Lord Balfour by Lionel Rothschild. Uh, and the leader of this state that Britain looks so uh, sympathetically upon well, the leader of the Jews of the state was Chaim Weizmann. He was made the leader of the Jewish agency. Another, uh, well, look, it wasn't easy getting Israel away from the Turks. Uh, the British had to, uh, well, they had to shift troops, hundreds of thousands of them, mind you, from the European front, where it was a complete deadlock. Uh, they needed those troops to Palestine, and, well, the legend is that Chaim Weizmann found a way to make acetone for explosives from dried up paint. There wasn't a bomb made from this process, but the British sure took Israel or Palestine. And look, meeting in London after the war, they had a problem with this Palestine. Now, Weizmann and Balfour, well, there were people living in Palestine, most of whom were religious Jews. The business, look, they were the majority in major, major cities. Uh, Jerusalem, Svat, Tiberias. Now, the myth was, well, was aborned of an ancient Palestinian Arab indigenous population. There were visitors in Palestine, uh, many as talented as Twain and Balzac, who accurately noted the paucity of Arabs in the land. After the British and the Zionists arrived, they came from as far away as Iraq to take advantage of the, of the uh, uh, sudden wealth in Palestine, but to neutralize these religious Jews, who really, really were not Zionistic at all. Yeah, in other and words, they just lived in the land. They just... Just like the uh, antiquity, yeah, just, and these are like the Jews that are living right now in Tehran or in Iran. They're basically well, there aren't just, many of them, but they're, the point yeah. is they made Weizmann the head of the Jews. The Jewish agency oh, was okay. the headquarters of basically labor Zionism, but we'll get to that. It didn't no. start that way, right. but they they appointed the chief rabbi of Israel, that was a Rav Avram Cook. He just stole the land, stripped the lands of the Orthodox Jews. And, well, under the new concept, the purity of land redemption, which is not part of uh, Judaism, but neither here nor there, he was playing out the Sabbatean nightmare, and all these Europeans who had come uh, to Palestine didn't know they were playing out the Sabbatean nightmare. This is a concept. I'm not going to dive into it right now. Yeah. My parents were labor Zionists. They didn't believe in evil. They just got sucked in. Yeah, they all were right? naive. In other words, they, yeah, they were naive to the to the full extent of it. They, sh they should have known better in retrospect, but there would have been no changing them. This is what they were raised with to save the Jews. Uh, if there was an Israel during the Second World War, there wouldn't have been a Holocaust on this stuff. That's what my parents uh, uh, raised me in. When I got to Israel, it was pretty well, uh, it was sucked out of me once I got to Israel. But yeah, yeah. What what you had in America. Look, the issue, the Jews didn't want to go to Israel. Instead, they chose America. Now, look, this is another story, but President Woodrow Wilson, uh, he was thoroughly corrupted by the Frankists. 
using their agent, Colonel House. It was supposedly Wilson. He didn't have a mind left to do this, but it was supposedly Wilson who put an end to America's open immigration policy. Until then, the European Jews rejected Palestine as an escape route. The majority chose America as their destination. But from now on, well, with America closed, very few would enjoy that option anymore. It was uh, go to Palestine or nowhere. Wow. And this is similar to what happened with uh, William Lyon Mackenzie King as well in Canada. Oh, he was the worst. He, He was just immoral. But let's not jump to that yet. You're yeah, right okay. about that. You're right, but it's going to throw us off. Yeah, let's continue. Look, look, as an example of that, what happened is the Jews got on boats, and they were turned away everywhere they went, especially Canada, but also America and also Cuba. There was a movie made of it. was called Ship of Fools. It's absolutely right. The Jews didn't understand why everyone was rejecting them, but they had no choice. You either accepted Palestine, that's all that was open in Nazi Germany, was Palestine, that's it, or or they'd be shipped back to their death. Yeah, in other words, they, were, they, were, they, need, they needed bodies no to fill the state. Yeah, then they had only one agency now representing the Jews, and there was only one destination, Palestine or die. Look, the majority of German Jews got the message after a while. Uh, They didn't have that long a while. But if you want confirmation of the conspiracy between labor Zionism and Hitler and his thugs, well, read the transfer agreement by Edwin Black. By the way, the transfer agreement was between labor Zionists and they became the only Jewish organization in Nazi Germany. It's a long story, but yes, they, well, it's a very difficult book to read, but yes, labor Zionists were working with Nazis. All right? Yeah, that's amazing. You can read more about that. Read Perfidy by Ben Hecht. Um, That's, well, I'm not going to go into what it is. Uh, we we don't have the time today, uh, but there are the scared of the doom by Jacob Nuremberger. The deal was this: the German Jews would be indoctrinated into Bolshevism in labor Zionist camps, and then, with British approval, transferred to Palestine. Well, wow. the British canceled that. In 1939, Europe's Jews were trapped, and the uh, Sabbateans got the Jews they wanted to start Israel. Amazing. Back in a moment with more with Barry Thomas. Welcome back, and uh, yeah, the events of the last uh, three or four weeks, Turkey is doing their very best to provoke, and of course it all comes back to some of these this history that you're giving. Barry, please continue. Yeah, without this history, nothing makes sense. Um, therefore, I'm continuing, and I'm not going to be uh, uh, lured into modern history quite yet. Now, yeah, maybe Wednesday look. we'll get into some more next week, or a future show, but let's let's uh, kind of tie it together. Look, you've got this. Uh, not all all Jews were thoroughly um, stupefied by the secrecy, but a lot of Jews who were Zionists didn't fall for the plan. The labor Zionists were cutting off. Look, anyone who wants to uh, boycott Nazi Germany. They got no help from the Zionists. None. There was nothing being done about Hitler because a deal was cut between labor Zionism and the Nazis. It's called the transfer agreement. But not every Jew fell for it. Now, there was... It really, it was a very noble alternative Zionism. Uh, it was led by Zev Jabotinsky. Supposedly, Netanyahu is a successor to him and the Likud, but it's not. 
Uh, it's not. Uh, the Likud has been so thoroughly co-opted. Let's just say this. Jabotinsky had a plan that demanded all European Jews have free passage to Palestine and that a world economic boycott of the Nazi regime would bring it down. He wanted a Jewish army. Labor Zionists did everything in their power to short circuit, circuit the opposition. They threw them out of the Jewish agency. They, this transfer agreement forced all German Jews coming to Palestine to use their assets to buy only goods from Nazi Germany. They had no choice. And then they just got rid of everybody. I mean, they got rid of everybody. Uh, this Weizmann and his Jewish agency, they got rid of Jabotinsky. He died a very suspicious death in New York in 1941. And, well, Ben Hex, who wrote Perfidy, um, which I won't dive into today, he was run over by a truck, a truck on a Manhattan sidewalk. Uh, he was the first to expose the Jewish agency Nazi plot. There were Jews who knew, but they were dealt with, I mean, they just were dealt with viciously. Now, I don't want to overstate the Jesuit role and the Illuminati role, but I'm going to discuss the American role in, in this worldwide conspiracy. And we can't ignore it. I'm going to return once again to Jerry Rabo. Remember, he wrote the middle of the road Jewish history, <laughs> 50 Jewish Messiahs. Page 132, quote, Frankish families, both those living as Christians and those living as Jews, try to marry only amongst themselves. In the summers, the German groups regularly held secret meetings in the resort of Carlsbad. It is said by the middle of the 19th century, the majority of the lawyers in Prague and Warsaw were from Frankish families. United States Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter is reported to have received a copy of Ava Frank's portrait from his mother, a descendant of the Prague Frankist family. Now, this is a lot to take in. I'll give you one quote from Felix Frankfurter, okay? Just one. From U.S. Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter said, the real rulers in Washington are invisible and exercise their power from behind the scenes. Now, the difference between Jerry Rabel and Rabbi Antelman is Antelman actually proves that literally all of FDR's court Jews were German descended Sabbateans, determined to purge Jewry of its unnecessary morality believing non Sabbatean cohorts. Here's a, a very short list uh, of these Jewish community leaders in America. Louis Brandeis, <coughs> oh, excuse me again. Again, Supreme Court, what else? Uh, received education, secondary school education in Germany, introduced to Zionism. Let's just go through them fast. FDRs. Court Jews included, well, Felix Frankfurter, Louis Brandeis, Henry Margenthal Jr., Stephen Weiss, who was the head of the reform movement. Uh, we won't dive into how significant that is. Bernard Baruch, Judah Magnus, Felix Warburg, every one of them descended from German Jews. All right, that's like saying, well, Obama's cabinet is full of CFR members. Yeah, it, <laughs> exactly. This is, it's not like in America there, you rise from humble beginnings and uh, get on the Supreme Court. 
they they were appointed sabbateans. In America right. today, the Supreme Court doesn't have a Protestant on it. It's got a bunch of Jews and a bunch of Catholics. That's it. Yeah, that's true, isn't it? And, of course, that's the cabal that's running things. That's the sabbateans running things. Right, sabbateans, yeah. All right, now, if you want to talk to me, look, again, we're not going to dive into it. Most of them don't know they're doing the dirty work of the sabbateans. They don't know it. They think they're liberal. They think they're left. They don't know they're completely guided. Yeah, they don't even know that their liberalism is being used to guide this, uh, to, to actually put forward this higher uh, or more evil agenda. They don't even know their liberalism uh, is actually being used. We'll dive into that, but no, they don't. Yeah. No. All right. Look, I'll give you a quote um, from one of, well, from James Paul Warburg. This was to the United States Senate on February 7th, 1950. All right. He said, he told them, we shall have world government whether or not we like it. The only question is whether world government will be achieved by conquest or consent. That was a major sabotean telling the truth. Now, as for who was James Warburg, well, he was the son of Paul Maurice Warburg, the nephew of Felix Warburg, and of Jacob Schiff, both of Kuhn Loban Company, which poured millions through the Rothschild banks, millions into the Russian Revolution through his brother Max. That is, Jacob Schiff's brother Max was the banker to the Ger German government who gave the Russian revolutionaries their, their funds. He told yeah. Congress, you're going to get a new, uh, you're going to get a world government whether you like it or not. That was one of the rare, the rare, well, that was him being honest. Yeah, maybe he was right. being a little boastful because he felt so certain that this was going to happen. Well, well, he might as well happen. be boastful. Yeah, of course. It worked like a charm. I mean, what the heck? The fact remains. Oh, I hear music. We hear music and we have one more segment. Barry will be back on the third hour on we Wednesday. We only have 15 more minutes. We do indeed. It goes by so quickly when we're listening to Barry Chalmers. All right, I'll, I'll hurry up the end. We'll get to the end. Sounds good. back and uh, Barry Chamish um, so uh, this is quite an amazing revelation here we're going to come back on Wednesday and talk about the Sephardim the Falasha Jews from Ethiopia and the situation. no it wasn't the Falashas they didn't come until the 70s I, mean, I always think of the flashes, yeah. The Sephardim were before that. So we're going to get into all of that on Wednesday. Uh, sort of wrap up today. Uh, if you wanted to summarize this history and where it's brought us, can right, you tell I'll, us? I'll, I'll get us into Wednesday. First thing is I'm going to plug myself. Um, you have to read me to understand. I'm just doing it. I'm scratching the surface. My books are at lulu.com. That's www.lulu.com. You'll see a search box right in my name. C-H-A-M-I-S-H. -H. That's how you spell Chamish. It'll take you to two versions of Shabtai Tzvi, Labor Zionism, and the Holocaust. Don't get the color one. It's a ripoff. Cost too much money. Get the black and white one. You can even download it for a few bucks. Now, oh, and my website, ably run by uh, Tom Mack, is BarryChamish.com. Com. You can get my address from the website. You write me. I've got a new DVD. I'm a commentator on um, Steve Stavros' 
uh, new three-hour movie. It's called The uh, Clear and Present Evil. And I'll send it to you, as well as my Shop Heights V Labor Zionism and the Holocaust DVD. All right, we're finished with this. Now let's, I guess, uh, pave the way, a segue uh, for Wednesday. Look, when World War II ended, now remember, Chaim Weitzman, in 1936, I believe in Prague, it doesn't matter, it was at the World Zionist Conference without any opposition. What he said is, not many Jews will survive the upcoming Holocaust. He used the word Holocaust. He said, perhaps two million, but they will be strong and good for Israel. The rest will be in the ash pit of history. Go on the internet, look up that quote. He knew the Holocaust was coming. Now, the word Holocaust is important because it's a Holocaust is like a blood sacrifice. Is that what that means? This was before it even began. He knew it was coming. Yeah, that's really terrible, isn't it? It, yeah, no kidding. But only wherever the Nazis were, only a hundred thousand European Jews survived, not the two million. And well, that wasn't enough. You couldn't run a state with a hundred thousand psychologically traumatized Jews um, but they, those that got to Palestine had to obey <laughs> Bolshevik edicts or starve to death but it wasn't enough they had a worse enemy the biggest enemy of the Frankist state the Sabbatean state was the Arabs look Without mincing words, they were savage tribes. They threatened the whole enterprise, and only a huge infusion of soldiers, Jewish soldiers, could stave off them, well, another Holocaust. And by the way, that problem has not ended. It's getting right. worse, but I don't want to I don't want to go there yet. Right. I don't want to go there yet. Look, to that end, the <coughs> European controls, Arab dictators, were persuaded to go against their national interests and to stir up bloody anti Semitism and get the Sephardim to Israel. And the reason they did that, they seized the Jewish assets just like the Germans, just like the transfer agreement. It was being done all over again. The Middle Eastern Jews were being treated like the European Jews. Now, I know this is a tough thing to, again, if you've heard this for the first time, I don't bluff and I'm not wrong. If I was a bluffer or a liar, I would have been found out already before the Sabbateans introduced it, there was no such thing as Jewish self-hatred. Find it in the literature somewhere. Once they were in power, oh my goodness. It used to be being Jewish came as naturally as breathing. This is, well, this was the state of the European Jews when they were driven to Israel. But then the Frankists applied all the lessons they learned to turn German Jews into their image. And it was applied to the Sephardim. Now, we're, if you want, I'll talk about this on Wednesday. Every effort was made to divest these people of their faith, and the results were terrible. I mean, god awful. Where was uh, the Sephardim from? Uh, let's talk about the origin. From Morocco to Iran, the yeah. Middle East. Right. And, well, the Moroccans who fled to France, well, they were, they were successful. In Israel, they're the criminal class. Uh, they turned the Jews upside down. Right. All right. As, but that is some, some story. But as for in America, uh, the effect of these German uh, Jews, like... Oh, Henry Kissinger is a big one. Madeleine Albright is a big one. The list of these German Jews in America and the effect they've had on America 
these are Sabbateans. John Kerry came from a Sabbatean family on his father's side. Uh, Albert Gore's uh, uh, daughter married the grandson of Jacob uh, Schiff. Exactly, yeah. Amazing, isn't it? Pretty tight. Well, once you understand, this is also an American. They're doing the Jews no favor, okay? Uh, right. Not a Jew. Well... 100,000 Jews survived the Nazis. That's it. The rest perished, and cruelly beyond belief. It was a sadistic and awful way to go, but as much... I wouldn't say you can put them the same camp as the Nazis, but the labor Zionists cut a deal with the Nazis to save their kind, and the rest they let perish. Yeah, let perish or... How can I say it? It's almost like they were a part Rabbi of the whole Anselman scheme. Rabbi calls it the burnt offering. That in the Sabbatean religion, if you can call it that, being burnt alive was the only proper punishment for someone who didn't believe that Shabbat TV was the Messiah. Oh, my. It's not an oh, my situation. They, along with the Illuminati, which once again, its source is the Vatican, not Frankism. Yeah. But nonetheless, they have, the damage they have done to the Jewish people is simply indescribable. Yeah. They infiltrated within us, and we can't get rid of them. And of course, the current situation with uh, Netanyahu you mentioned on one of the breaks is that we're in grave danger that the current policies and timeline is heading toward a missile war it's and, guaranteed yeah. it's guaranteed you think the Arabs are building up these forces not to use them yeah I know it's a, there's up to 200,000 missiles and the uh, Jafar 5 which is a GPS coordinated missile can carry three to 500 uh, pounds of explosives there's chemicals, enough et cetera. to pound Israel into oblivion Absolutely, by probably multiple times, actually, not just once. Again, we're good. Let's let's stay in the present, uh, if that's what you want to do. Yeah, we only have a this minute or two left. Chronological. Uh, yeah. We chronologically got to the state where a second Holocaust. And again, you're right. My children, my family, my friends are all in Israel. And if you think I'm not worried about this stuff, you're wrong. Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm uh, terrified that what will happen is literally they're preparing for a second Holocaust. Again, if on Wednesday you want to talk Spardim and what they did next in Israel, I'll do it. Absolutely. Very timely to deal with this, this time in history. It's always amazing, timely. Ama yeah, amazing discussion, uh, Barry. Again, uh, Barry's website is Barry Chamish, C H A M I S H, dot com. His books are at Lulu dot com and also over at Clay and Iron dot com. You want to get this material, this is going to straighten you out in terms of what's really going on. You'll not understand current history if you don't understand what Barry teaches. Remarkable work. Good Wednesday. Thank you, Barry Chavish. Back tomorrow with Stan Dale, Hour 1, Hour 3, Jonathan Gray from New Zealand. Wednesday, Harley Schlanger and Barry Chavish will be back talking about the Sephardim and much more.